Hey guys, welcome back to book club. Missed you. Um, we have a really exciting day today because we are having Michelle, AKA Japanese breakfast on, who I have been a fan of for a very long time. And then of course, when I came across her memoir, I, my first thought was, she's too young to have a memoir and then my second instinct was read it and i'm so happy i did i cried my way through all of it um and also craved korean food through all of it but it is so beautiful and so incredible i'm sure most of you have read it but if you haven't definitely read it it came out last month um and in 2018 she wrote an essay for the new yorker and this is kind of an expanse of that essay um and it talks about her grief um, and losing her mother, who was her access point to Korean culture and also how food connects us culturally um, through family, through relationships. And um, I just, reading a book like this, I was so moved and I cannot, you know, hype it up enough. You guys just need to read it for yourself. Um, but, you know, she talks a lot about being at an intersection of two cultures and also just the grief of losing someone and I honestly have not read a book that I think captures grief in this kind of way since I read Joan Didion's A Year of Magical Thinking. Um, so that is a testament to Michelle that she was able to capture grief in this really incredible way. Um, and it's just, again, so amazing. And before I bring Michelle on, because we are so lucky to have her on here today, even though she's very busy, um, I just want to read a couple of quotes that I pulled from the book. So first one is, it felt like the world had divided into two different types of people, those who had felt pain and those who had yet to. And now I'm sure if you have lost someone that you love, you understand this. I know that I have. And um, it's a very sad divide, but very true. And then she also writes a beautiful quote about her mother. She says, I remember these things clearly because that was how my mother loved you. Not through white lies and constant verbal affirmation, but in subtle observations of what brought you joy, pocketed a way to feel, to make you feel comforted and cared for without even realizing it. And I will say, I think mother-daughter relationships aren't always an easy thing to capture the complexity of and Michelle does a really amazing job of doing that especially the transition from you know mother-daughter as you grow up to having a more adult relationship with your mother which is something that I have been lucky enough to have my mother there for and something that Michelle you know felt got cut short and um, I don't want to put words in her mouth so I would love to bring her on but yeah I everyone needs to read this book <laughs> Let's bring her on. Hi, Milo. Excuse Milo, he wants to be on. Milo, this is not your book club. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, I just came. I'm in LA right now, actually, uh, and I just came from a shoot. And I think so. The person who did my hair is Rachel or Uncle Lee. Do you know them? I, I love Rachel. Yeah, she, she, yeah. She says hi. <laughs> I told her that I was doing this, and she was like, "Oh, I know Kaya. She's the sweetest. She's the best." I'm in LA too. It's so nice here right now. It's like a beautiful summer day. Um, yeah, it's it's gorgeous here. I think we're all in major need for summer summer times i'm very excited to eat korean food here in i mean i've actually been to the hot springs which are I mean, talk about going to them they're the best but i've never eaten on here and now i really feel like i need to definitely Do you have like a favorite dish um, yeah, I've gone to, uh, I usually go to Hungary, which is um, this kalguksu place. It's like a knife cut, Korean knife cut noodles. Uh, but today I think I'm going to try this place called the Crab House. <laughs> it doesn't sound Korean, but uh, there's this like raw, like 
fermented crab uh, that's a Korean dish that I really like. And it's really hard to find a good one in New York. So I'm really excited to, to go to this place called the Crab House. But I got a bunch of really good recs on, on Twitter that I'm excited to check out. Recs, because I, I don't know where to start. But now after, like, there were so many dishes in the book that I'd never heard of. And then after describing them, I was like, I've never tried this and I'm craving how. So um, that is a testament to your right. But I just want to, um, obviously, you write music and I would write music. I love it. But the memoir is that you feel like because you've been writing music for so long that it made it almost easy to be that writing. Yeah, I do think that there is something about being a musician like that's unique to that medium that people are already kind of infusing so much of your personal life into your work and, and they assume to feel this kind of like intimacy or closeness to you. And I also feel like from an early age, when I started writing, I was always writing about these types of personal experiences. Uh, but it was a little bit easier because there's so much more uh, to hide behind, you know, because you have such a limited space um, to sort of verbally express yourself that it's it's all very impressionistic in this way that writing a memoir is not. So it was definitely a little bit more nerve wracking uh, to have all of this information out there. <laughs> and I also noticed in music, it can be a bit more glamorous. I actually loved how in the I behind any of the glamour and you were like very honest about grief um, in that way. I do think that, you know, it can be something that people try to make and it you know, actually do you feel like for you from writing music to then writing um yeah sorry it, the audio is cutting out a bit so i'm getting like okay. half of it uh but i think it was about it was about being unflinching <laughs> right um yeah uh i think honestly a big part of it for me was um a big reason why I wanted to write this book to begin with, it was because there was this major feeling of no one had, no one could really understand what I endured and I needed mm -hmm. everyone to know in this sort of sick way because mm -hmm. I felt, I guess I just felt so alone in it and I just felt so unsure of, of how to explain it to people, what I had witnessed and what I had gone through. And um, yeah, that was a major reason I, I wanted to write the book was because I need I needed people to sort of know and to air my grievances in, in this kind of way. Right. And I loved how that you talk about touring psycho pump and how you, you know, in moments you just like wished your mother was there, but also realized that, you know, there was no world where she could have been there and you could have been singing about that. Like, how was that sort of, you know, mixed emotions for you? And do you feel like you're experiencing that? again with the release of this book yeah it is a really wild feeling i mean i'm not a religious or particularly spiritual person but i've led um a very charmed life after my mother passed away mm -hmm. and i had been you know a struggling musician for for a few right. years before i wrote this album that was largely about my mother and her passing and all of a sudden I began to experience mm -hmm. but yeah I mean I feel like in a way I mean I talk about this a little bit in the book it felt like it felt in some way because my mom was a homemaker I was her ultimate art you know mm -hmm. and in some ways like when when the book came out and, and, and it touched so many people and it got on the bestseller list it felt like it was something that we had accomplished together. It was like I had told our story in, in the mm -hmm. way that um, was true and, and uh, everything that she had taught me had sort of kind of led to this moment. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm ultimately just really proud of it. And I feel like she would be really proud for me. It's easier, it's easier to deal with now in a way than it, than it was in, initially because it was so new back yeah. then. And, and now I guess I have some experience of, of um, talking about it. Right. And do you feel like writing them memoir was a form of therapy for you and like processing and dealing with that grief? Yeah, absolutely. I feel like it, I mean, in more ways than I could have ever anticipated. Like I, <laughs> I feel like one thing that's really great um, about writing a book is that you really have to dig into 
the other players like um perspectives and and what mm -hmm. brought them to act the way that they did or or what um happened in their past that might lead them to be the way that they are and right. i feel like i was able to really forgive the people i kind of presented uh for some mm -hmm. time and also i think i felt so much guilt about how much like shit i put my mom through in my teenage mm -hmm. years and i was able to kind of look back at that moment and investigate it in this new way and and find a sort of new forgiveness for myself so it was it was really really therapeutic for me it was hard yeah. but it was really therapeutic yeah and i think like i saw that a lot of critics were saying that every mother and daughter will find themselves in this book um and i think that's totally true and it, like i said before like it's a very complex relationship i think as a mother and daughter sort of grow up um and that relationship changes did you have any intention of sort of, you know, feeling like you wanted people to be able to relate or was it just really personal and then it happened to resonate? Yeah, I think I tried to just explore our relationship as openly and honestly as possible, but I knew that this particular type of cruelty that is kind of associated with Asian moms, like this, this, this particular mm -hmm. kind of critical judgmental nature uh was really important for me to capture because it was a really big part of my mom and i's relationship it was a really yeah. tumultuous relationship uh for for a long time and i had to you know i i don't i never like doubted that my mother loved me but it was a really important thing that i wanted to um showcase because so much of what i felt like was really heartbreaking about losing her when i did when i was 25 was that I feel like even if you're not Asian American, like you, it's like the time when you return to your parents mm -hmm. and you can sort of see them as human beings and not just mom mm -hmm. and dad and, and mm -hmm. their role in your life. And so I feel like when you're in your mid to late twenties, like that's sort of when you hit the sweet spot where it, like you can kind of become uh, friends and, and uh, confide in one, each, one another in this new way right. and appreciate this sort of new relationship with one another. And mm -hmm. that was what was so heartbreaking was we, our relationship was just starting to get really good mm -hmm. when she gets it. And yeah, so it was really important for me to kind of capture that feeling. But I also had a sense that a lot of girls and their, a lot of daughters and their mothers like have this type of, of relationship. Yeah, and I think, you know, there's like always the teenage years of wanting to be everything that your parents are not, especially I think with, with girls and their mothers. Um, and then, you slowly start to accept the fact that you are like them in a lot of ways and like celebrate it. Um, but it does take time. And like, you know, you say you rediscovered and like kind of were able to find your mom and even your aunt and your grandma through cooking and through food. Um, how, like, was that just always something that was really prevalent in your life or why was that the outlet that you felt like you were able to like re, re find her in? Yeah, I think that there was a few reasons and I and I don't think I really knew what they were until I sort of started writing this book. Um, mm -hmm. It would be, you know, it was very simple to think like, oh, well, it was how, you know, in some ways it, it was how my mother expressed her love in, in a lot of ways. Like my mom, every time I came home from college would prepare this meal like three days in advance where she like mm -hmm. marinated the meat for like my arrival and like got all the great like stocked the fridge with all of the things that I love to eat um mm -hmm. not just Korean things but like things from my hometown of Eugene uh Oregon that I, I love to eat and uh I didn't mm -hmm. even realize it for a long time that that was the way that she sort of expressed her uh her affection for me so there was that but it was also I think I realized there was this major sort of psychological undoing of the kind of failure that I felt as, as a caretaker that I wasn't sort of able to prepare these dishes for her when she was sick and that mm -hmm. this woman Kay who came to live with us kind of took over this role that I, I felt like I really want I needed to do in order to be there for her in order to complete mm -hmm. this sort of cycle as a daughter that you feel like you're gonna have to assume someday when it when it comes time and I felt like such so much shame i think as a fit as a carekeeper as a caretaker for not knowing how to make these dishes that the first mm -hmm. dish that i learned how to make after she passed away was the dish that this woman kept making for her which was this pine nut forage and i think like in retrospect it was very much um that and also being mixed race feeling like um if i don't actively preserve this part of my identity i'm gonna lose it 
And so right. it became this sort of ritual for me to interact with, you know, every day for 30 to minutes to an hour to two hours where I would make something for myself and I would think about her and also think about my cultural heritage and, and feel like I was actively trying to preserve it in some way. Right. And like just making like those little practices every day. And you talk about watching the YouTube videos and going to buy things. And there is like this whole, I mean, I, I just think the active like practice of trying to preserve that is something that a lot of people can probably feel lost in. Um, and you talk about feeling like stuck between sort of an intersection. Um, and I just thought that the way you talk about preserving that is, is really amazing. And I wanted to ask if you had like a favorite dish that she made you and, and if you if you have now started to make it. Yeah, I mean, there's little things that I'll always think about. Um, mm -hmm. Her kimchi jjigae, which is like a kimchi stew that mm -hmm. like is probably every Korean person's like comfort food. I know how to make that pretty well. And I, I have this memory of the way that she made it. And mm -hmm. it helped to have Mangchi, who's this Korean YouTube blogger, mm -hmm. kind of like lay down the basics and be like, okay, my mom wouldn't have used like an like a dashi. She used just like a meat, uh, <laughs> like right. pork belly instead. Right. Um, and so I would sub these things in, and 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 now I feel like pretty confident making that. Or mm -hmm. um, there's a dish called jajangmyeon, which are um, like these Chinese uh, Korean fusion black bean mm -hmm. noodles. That my mom, I remember specifically my mom always saying like the trick to that is like you add a lot of onions. So like every time I make that I'm always like lots of onions. Yeah, you're like you're like you can add. And you also talk about the way that like you would ask her to make things and she was like can you just do however much of this and this and like not have being specific. And I have recipes from my mom where like I see her make them, but I think if she would then try to explain it to me, like she'll give it to me and she's like, like a handful of this. And I'm like, well, I don't like, I don't know what a handful is. Our hands are a different size. I know, <laughs> <laughs> sort of trying to um, translate it. But do you, now do you have like your own dish that has be that you feel like now is, is yours? Yeah, what am I what am I making lately? Um, I it's I I, have, I don't know if I've like made anything too new. I guess I like learned how to make um <laughs> and but there's this there's a thing called totori muk which is like an acorn jelly which sounds really okay. weird that my mom never made, but I went to this place uh in Seoul and I had this like amazing side dish. It's like, mm -hmm. it's made out of acorn starch and it's like kind of like a jello. <laughs> it it okay. sounds really weird, but it's really good. Uh, and it's like mixed with sesame oil and seaweed and kimchi. Mm -hmm. And it's a really delicious like salad uh, mm -hmm. that's healthy mm -hmm. and vegetarian. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. It's I also love like when you talk about finding your mom's kimchi fridge in, um, in Peter's parents' house and also all of the photographs. Like, did she document your whole life in pictures or was there much in them or was it mostly just pictures of you and of your, your family? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Uh, I, my parents always expressed like remorse over the fact that their parents never took photos. And I guess like to be fair, like when they were growing up, it was probably much more expensive, but right. I think my they always felt like neglected in in some ways. Like they both mm -hmm. come from larger families. Like my dad was the youngest of four and raised by a single mom, and my mom was like the middle child. Mm -hmm. And her family had all these photos of her younger sister because her grand she was her grandmother's favorite, and she had all of the money. So all of the photos are just of like the youngest <laughs> sister, and so. I think because they both had this like sadness that there weren't that many photos from their childhood. Mm -hmm. And that's why like in, 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 in the book, like this is like kind of a rare photo of like, this was, mm -hmm. this was my mom. And this is her oh. like beloved younger sister who we have like a bunch of um, photos of. Right. Uh, so this was kind of like a rare thing for me to find um, these these old photos of her. She was always saying like, oh, they never took photos of me. And also being an only child and having this homemaker for a mother, I think she, right. she went wild with it. Right. She had so many photos of me uh, as a child, like from every age, just like perfectly documented. And it's just me. It's I mean, there's there's some of us together, but 
It's largely it's my, my mom. My mom like obsessing over like her little beloved only. Oh <laughs> yeah. I mean, and I'm I'm a second child, and I feel like there's a million pictures of my older brother, and then by the second one, my parents were like, mm. yeah. like <laughs> <laughs> um, and I also like you retell the story of taking care of your mother in that time you know such detail did you journal or how did you recall that experience in like such extreme detail yeah I am one of those people where like every every single year I make a resolution to keep a journal and I like mm -hmm. keep one from like the month of January and then fall off yeah um, and I wish I did because I think that it would be it's it's so tremendously helpful for writing I I think I had like snippets here and there of mm -hmm. um you know, it's like when you're writing a memoir, it's kind of like you're pouring over evidence, like no matter how small. So there would be like little <laughs> snippets of diaries that I kept in May of one year that I would use part of. And then I never wrote about it again. And then a lot of it was just like free writing for, you know, every day and like seeing what weird little like things followed. And also just like actively thinking about this moment of your life for five years I think helps to just sort of like you start kind of training your brain to kind kind of like constantly start pocketing away th things that could fit into different chapters and stuff right um so yeah I didn't really have much of a journal I do feel like if I if I were to write another book I would definitely want to write like I would want to keep a journal and 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 write from from that experience because I think it is a really excellent hobby um to partake in yeah, I, I'm the same. I'll do it for like the month of January and then stop. And I always wish, like, I'll look back at pictures and I'm like, I wish I had a journal from that time. So, yeah. Um, but you have this whole entire book that I think captures it, you know, incredibly. And are there other books that inspired you to write this? Or was it just like you felt like you just needed to get it out? Oh, I definitely read a ton of memoir. I never <laughs> read much memoir before um, yeah, sort of yeah. like training for this book. Um, but yeah, I, I was watching your introduction and I, uh, or not introduction, but just like the beginning of your video. <laughs> and um, you mentioned Joan Didion's Your Magical Thinking and, mm -hmm. and that book and, and the Blue Hours, I think is what it's called. Um, Blue Nights, yeah. Blue, Blue, yeah, yeah. Um, those two books about grief, I, I think are, are so tremendous and mm -hmm. were definitely uh, huge influences on the book. Um, mm -hmm. There's a writer named MFK Fisher that my uh, creative writing professor recommended to me who wrote this book called uh, The Gastronomical Me and Consider the Oyster. And she has some like really old school, like amazing uh, food writing that I just loved. Oh. I love uh, Ruth Reichel's uh, Tender at the Bone, another amazing mm -hmm. food memoir, Nora Ephron's Heartburn. Uh, I love David Sedaris's um, short, short fiction. I love, or uh, yeah, I guess short fiction or nonfiction. And um, I love Anthony Bourdain's food writing. Um, I really love this novel called The Vegetarian by Han Kang, who's uh, a Korean writer who kind of writes about, it's kind of like the more horrifying aspect of, of food. It's about this woman who kind <laughs> of like develops an eating disorder, but it's like more haunting, like even more haunting than that. Uh, there's like an element of sort of magical realism and I and and reading that like really um, made me think about how important it was to write this food memoir that also encompassed the way that food can be uh, really horrific and traumatizing you know I mean I feel like that was a really important portion of the book where like we lose this real love and passion for food because we're counting calories and um, monitoring her eating and chemotherapy makes it very difficult for um, my mom to want to eat anything or, or maintain her weight so that book was also really influential on, on this writing process. Yeah and and you talk about like keeping the journals of, of how much food she ate do you feel like having a task like that made you feel a little bit like you could remove yourself at times and just, you know, handle that task rather than the, I'm sure, emotional uh, roller coaster that it was. Yeah, it felt like, you know, this mask will save Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was a big part of it. I mean, I think that that's a really human thing to, like, try to, like, create um, illusions of control, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that that was a very big thing where I was like, 
running a lot. I was like, never exercised in my life before my mom got sick. And then like, suddenly I'm running five miles an hour, like convincing myself that if I do that, it will somehow help everyone. Yeah. And like, um, yeah, just do adding up her calories every day and like, um, monitoring like her medications and, and what she ate was, you know, I mean, you just feel so helpless that I think that it's pretty common to like create these, these weird, uh, like work, like I like regimens, you know, to make you yeah. feel like um, you're helping in some way. Yeah, I mean, that's a very human practice. And do you think that you would write another book? Yeah, I do actually. Yeah, I, I feel like you just learn so. You know, I I just learned so much about writing a book um, mm -hmm. through writing. And I'm sure about book. yourself too. Yeah, yeah, I learned so much about myself, but also just like the like nerdy craft stuff. And like, I think also just having the confidence to, you know, like that I've written it before. And like so much of the first one is kind of like feeling around in the dark being like, I don't know if I'm like doing this right. And now that I have like had the sort of validation of just like, you did okay, kid. Like I I do feel like I could apply like, um, so much of, of what I learned from this one and also have so much more confidence like going into a second one though I'm sure mm -hmm. similar to like writing a record there's there there will be like this kind of fear of the sophomore slump in a, in a way right right um well thank you so so much for coming on and also for writing this book I just think you captured grief and food in such an amazing way and um like I said before <laughs> like I've only found that in Joan Didion and I just, I and you also like I just felt like your mother lived so much in this book and um, and I think everyone who read that felt that so thank you um, for telling this story and hopefully we get more from you. Thank you so much Kaya. Thank you. Thank you. Well thank you guys so much for watching. Um, if you haven't yet please please go read Crying in H Mart. As you can see I wore mine down um, very much, but it's such a beautiful memoir. And also, her new album, Jubilee, is out, so go listen to that. Um, and yeah, I can't wait for more book club.